So these are like the holy grail for cash flow in an Amazon business. So you don't have to have any other third party loan your money, which gets really expensive with their fees, or you don't have to get any short term cash flow loans. Hey, folks, welcome back to the High Voltage Business Builders Podcast. I'm your host, Neil Twa. I have a special episode today. One I'm excited about, we've been talking for the last few days about the process of this conversation and kind of prepping it because I've been excited to, Aaron and I, to talk with this gentleman who I've actually known for a long time. And it's not like it's a new conversation. That's one of the reasons why I'm excited is it's always good to talk with old friends and he happens to be an old mate. We've known each other since, what, 2000? And I'm going to stretch back in time in my memory, 2014-ish, maybe 15? If brain starts to correct me if I'm wrong, okay, it's been a while. I slept a few times, so I probably forgot some things since then. But I'm going to have him talking today about Amazon because that's what we're going to do today. We talk about all kinds of things on the podcast for those of you who listen and know. We talk about business and e-commerce and real estate and alternatives and wealth building and mindset and on the entrepreneurial journey. Aaron has all of that. I met him in 2014 when he was a part of his journey of becoming an Amazon seller. He's gone on to do many different things since then, and he's established some new business in the last two to three years. It's really doing great. Still in the Amazon space, and we're going to cover that today. But I'm excited to have him on because he's a wealth of information. We love him because he's our British ally. That's all I can refer to him. But he knows I'm going to joke about this. So don't, no one's going to take offense to it. This is a non-offensive podcast. If you like, if you think you're going to be offended, then please just stop listening now. But the end result is that Aaron is a good guy. He's a family man. He has been a good business guy and I enjoy his company and I'm excited to have him on. Aaron, thanks for coming and having a chat with me today, man. Neil, it's a pleasure and thanks for having me on. Now, I we mentioned earlier, you're in London, correct? Or just outside of uh, London, England, is that right? That's right. Sunny London, or not so sunny as you can see. <laughs> I actually t- saw that earlier. He corrected me. I was like, hey, look, you got sun today. So it was a big deal. And he's like, no, it's still a little gray. Still a little yeah. gray. It's still a little gray everywhere, but that's okay. So you and I got started into Amazon a long time ago. I started in around 2012, and, and we met up about two, two, three years later in your journey. How did you decide and, and what started? Let's go back in the Wayback Machine for a second. But what got you even interested in selling on Amazon? Right. It was I was in Australia living in the far northwest in the mines, right? I was actually working in construction at the time. And it was around 2012, I was looking how I could start to make money online. So I was looking into the affiliate forums and so forth. And I got an email from a guy called Mark Ling, who does a big affiliate marketer. He was promoting his course on Amazon, which was one of the first Amazon big launches of courses at the time. And I dived headfirst into that. I went hell-bent on, on launching my products and brands. And after three or four months, I was able to quit my job in the mines, which was my goal, because the business started to generate some more profits and sales than I was expecting. Right. Fast forward about a year and a half, I believe it was 2014, 2015 now, I come across you through the Amazon community, took, signed up to your, you was actually my, the mentor, which I learned most from out of the whole Amazon selling journey that I went through. It was you and Reed back in 2014, 15, and yeah, joined your mastermind. I forgot the name of what it was back then, but wealth of knowledge and really helped catapult my business forward. And I was fairly green still in, into business at that point, but you taught me a whole lot of things, not around just Amazon, but how to read a P&L for e-commerce. That was one of the, the that one of the things that really stuck out to me and I've kept ever since. For that, I'm grateful. So thank you. No, my pleasure. You, you were a great student. You learned, you applied, and you executed. You did the best things that anybody could ask for. You were willing to be coachable and you did it, which is cool because you've evolved so far from that guy who was a construction worker in Australia. You've come a long way, mate, which is very cool to watch. And it's always a, a blessing to see people realize their potential, which I believe you've done. And it's led you into so many different things. Did you can you continued with that business? Where did that take you after 2014? Because uh, we lost track a little bit around 2016, 17, if I'm not mistaken, because you were kind of busy building your businesses, right? Exactly. Yeah. So what we did, we went on to build, I spent a lot of time in the Philippines. So we built like a team of 45 staff, 2014, 15, used a lot of your teachings to help with the systems and processes across these teams. And this team was really running multiple seven-figure Amazon brands. So my role really in that was to operation systems, processes, and team-based and people-based to help grow these companies. So that was going all really great. And then essentially we had, there was three founders of the company and we had a, a little bit of a disagreement with one of them. So I, t- I decided to go my, my own way. And then from there, because I was like a kid in a candy shop near when I first started, on Amazon. I was like, wow, this is great. Let's launch this brand. Let's launch this brand. And then as I left the partnership, the team that was running these brands went away. And then I was there to try and catch the falling plates 
so to speak, and actually went through a pretty tough period, went into quite a bit of debt with one of the companies. And thank God that's, we climbed out of that. It took us a little while, but I went into some debt and managed to turn it around really after that. So had a bit of a journey in the Amazon side of things. It was really a lesson in focus, Neil, trying to do too much. I think you learn that lesson. When you learn that lesson once, you learn it the hard way, you don't need to learn it again. That's been a, that's been a big part of my thesis and my, just the way I operate now is absolute focus, ruthless focus, right? And that's because it's been a it's been a painful lesson to say that to, to say that. So, and it's hard to teach, coach, or direct somebody through that. They literally have to kind of fall into that and find their way through it, sort of, because it's a mucky. It's always different for every person, every situation, every business. But focus and where you get into your most successful groove for you as a person, your business, and the people around you. That's tough to find. That is kind of like the holy grail scenario of any business relationship or any business growth. What did that lead you to? Like, where did you find yourself? getting your focus? What is it that you've started or did you focus into at that point that kind of led you where you are today? The great question. It, it happened kind of a, over a, a couple of years. So it wasn't like it took a while, but essentially what happened was through the process of building a, a large team, a fairly large team in, in the Philippines and running all these multiple seven-figure companies, I had a lot of knowledge around how to essentially recruit, hire and train VAs, how to have them essentially run a lot of the systems and processes for the Amazon business model specifically. And I took all that, all them lessons I learned and I decided to, because I had actually people reach out, hey, look, I know you run teams in the Philippines. Can you help us? We're looking for... So that usual scenario that you hear about all the time, people asking you to solve problems for them. And then I thought, I've got all these systems that work. We've generated multiple seven figures with these companies and these systems. I'm just going to give these systems to other people. And that's what we did for a few years actually. So we had a coaching group. We had probably 37 and a couple of eight figure sellers in there where we just had all these SOPs. They're like filing cabinets of SOPs. And we gave them the SOPs and then trained and helped them implement them into their business essentially. So that's what we did. And for those who don't understand an SOP or maybe didn't heard the language before, I'm gonna we're going to assume everybody has, but just in case, a standard operating procedure is what an SOP is short for. And it has to do with the specific task and outline of tasks that the duty is expected to complete. The person is expected to fulfill in a certain time frame and meet certain metrics or KPIs, key performance indicators of that SOP, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. So that's really what it was. It's a playbook of how to get consistent result in a repeatable way. You create them so that anybody off the, if I handed it to my grandma, she'd be able to Put ultimately better run it. Yeah, that, that's the simplicity. And so that's what I did for, I think maybe two and a half, three years. And I found out after a while that I really didn't like to coach people. It was mm -hmm. one of the things that just wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. And during that process, we actually started to sell some of the old Amazon stores that we had, which mm -hmm. is kind of leads on to what we do now. So that was kind of the trajectory of that journey. And we started acquiring and selling Amazon stores around four years ago. So it was about three and a half, four years ago. And that's kind of what we do full time. That's our entire focus. Okay. Yeah. So there's kind of a myth around the idea of, can I have multiple seller central accounts? Which I know that a lot of people are like, you can't have one. And the actual truth is you can when you do it the right way. Is that a similar kind of outcome for buying and selling central seller central accounts? Exactly. Yeah. It's there's as with Amazon, there's myths everywhere because of one person gets suspended and then they hear it from their cousin at Thanksgiving or right. And you can't have multiple stores, but Amazon are very okay with you having as many Amazon stores as you want, provided you've got a valid reason. There's whole teams built out inside of Amazon that deal with that specific criteria of seller. Amazon are okay with that. In terms of how to what we do, it's no different as if most of your listeners probably near with We'll be familiar with the aggregators in the space or the private equity firms buying up Amazon selling companies, yep. then it's no different to that process. Amazon allow thousands of these businesses to be bought and sold every year on the platform. Yep. What we do is exactly the same process. We just, when we acquire a store, it's just the store we're acquiring as through an asset purchase without all the, all the other bells and whistles you get when you buy an active business, if that yep. makes sense. Sure. So you're buying the business in technical terminology. It happens exactly, to come yeah. with a seller central login as part of that. It could just as well as come with a Shopify login or an Etsy login or a, any kind of other social media login or platform login, right? Exactly. Yeah. So we're, we're acquiring the assets of the business. And when folks buy these stores from us, they're doing exactly the same. They're acquiring the assets of the business. And that asset is the actual Amazon store. 
some folks, well, one thing we're looking at in 2024 is actually acquiring mildly profitable Amazon businesses. We've talked a little bit about this before with the email lists and all the social media profiles, trademarks, all the other assets that you get when you acquire an active business. But something we're, we're looking at launching in 2024, but for now, it's just the acquisition of the Amazon stores themselves. Cool. Let's unpack that a little bit in a minute. But before we do that, in terms of buying and selling these, what would be the um, reason why someone might want to sell the business? And what would be the reason why someone might want to buy one? Absolutely. So just like there's, I think there's, I heard this from Roland Fraser. He, I think he said there's 300 to 400,000 businesses that go out, just stop trading every year. Yes. Quote me on the numbers, but I think it's something in the region of 200,000 to 300,000 businesses. I've had him as a guest. It's roughly what I remember him saying, something around three to 500,000, yeah. just being upon the year. Yeah. Brilliant mm -hmm. guys. I think just as these businesses have all these different reasons, same with the Amazon space. So yep. people, they go for a divorce. They couldn't make the finances work. They've got kids. They've got a full-time job. The reasons are endless from what we've seen. Folks just throw in the towel. A lot of people, they got started. It was an amazing experience. But now they've just got a raise or they've just got a new promotion. They want to put more into that. All the reasons you can imagine. Yeah. So selling in is typically a negative to some degree when they're selling the accounts versus selling the business. It's typically going to be a business that has some concern, some issue, some ongoing concern that has to be dealt with. And they're kind of done with it for whatever particular reason. And they're looking to say, do I have an asset that's worth anything? But does anybody want to buy it? Right. So yeah, folks, oftentimes we get people that have actually had an exit, like they might have sold for seven figures and the buyer didn't want this store. So they were like, we've got store, we've got this. Now they're, they're left with this spare store sat on a digital shelf collecting dust. And we essentially acquire the asset from them and that gives them a win because they have, it's like finding money in your coat pocket at Christmas, right? You don't, sometimes you, you don't know you can sell something. That's oftentimes what we experience is folks, they've found out they can actually sell their store and get closure on it and then money off of it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Have um, something, something for the assets. And it makes a whole lot of sense. If you guys have got something out there, if you're one of those people listening to this, and this might be something you need to pay attention to if you've been thinking about selling it. If you're a new seller or even an existing seller and you're considering buying one, why not just have them? Why wouldn't a person just go and spend the $40 or what is it, $39.99 for the seller pro account and then just sign up and start the business versus buying one that, that might cost $500, $1,000, $10,000, $100,000? we have sold some for $50,000 <laughs> based on the criteria. What would be the reason for those two tracks and who would go down which one for what reason? Great question. So... It really depends on the store itself, but I use an analogy. I'll get to that in a second, but generally Amazon do not trust new seller accounts because you're new to their platform. You're just getting started. And that means they can throw in a lot of restrictions onto the store, things that prevent you from growing the stores. For example, you've got payment reserves. So these are, this is a big one, especially in the private label space, wholesale world uh, of Amazon selling. When you create a new Amazon store, Amazon, again, they don't trust you. So they throw yeah. on a, a payment reserve, which for the first month, I think it can take four or five weeks to receive any money from Amazon. And then it takes you up to a year to of proving that you can deliver to their customers and that you're a good seller, where they will then give you a, a better payment term on your store. So typically what it looks like is Amazon will hold 40% of your money in any given month until seven days after delivery date. Without getting too much into the weeds here, let's just say Put it like this, if Amazon owed you a hundred grand on from your in, in terms of net proceeds, after day 14 on a these are on older stores, you get paid in full from Amazon. That four hundred grand will hit your bank on maybe like day 15, day 16, right? Because it, it takes a, a day or two to go to your checking account. Mm -hmm. So it will take you 14 days to receive that four hundred grand in full, give or take a day. If you have a new store or you have a store which has what we call a reserve on, it will take you to receive that 400 grand, it would take you three and a half weeks to receive that 400 grand. And that really slows down the cash flow cycle of the business, which means there's less money to invest into inventory, PPC, product, launching new, you know, hiring team members or paying yourself. So essentially, it's, it throttles the, the growth of the business because you can't reinvest that money back into growing the business, which if you do reinvest the money, if you have a store which has no reserve, which are, these stores are from before 2016, what it enables, it's like compound uh, interest in the business. Right. It, it, the cash conversion cycle is shorter. That's just one example, but there's three types of no reserve stores. 
There's 14 day cycle, there's seven day cycle, which is, it's hard to compete against sellers if they get their money every seven days and four. It just is, right? If you can think about the rate of which they can sell products and get money in their bank, and it, it's hard to, to compete at that clip of, of growth. So there's 14 day stores that pay in full, seven days that pay in full, and then there's daily pay stores which pay in full. They're like the holy grail. These are probably, I think, what you mentioned earlier, Neil, I think you said you sold one a while back. But the, these stores, you have a button that you press inside the store, and Amazon pay you in full like daily. And these are from before 2006. So these are like the holy grail for cash flow in an Amazon business. So you don't have to have any other third party loan you money, which gets really expensive with their fees, or you don't have to get any short term kind of cash flow loans. Amazon's a game of cash flow, as we all know. So uh, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, it's very smart. And thank you for detailing that out. For those of you who are listening, if you're getting started, there's going to be a number of gates to go through. If you are getting started and this is a side hustle or a hobby business, you might want to take the time, energy, and attention to do that. You're also going to be spending a lot of money and time waiting to get done and get to a certain point where you can compete really in the marketplace. Seriously. Or if you're a serious person who's going in and you've got an existing business and you want to go hard or you're going to really put some time uh, and money into building a real business, you might consider buying an account and getting started faster. Those options will be weighed out by you. We're trying to just establish the pros and cons here. And hopefully for those who are listening, we've gotten clear on that because there are pros and cons to both. Your time is money. And if you're going to spend three weeks, four weeks, or even three to four months putting a seller account in a position to really get you to run quickly, run your revenues up, not be gated or stopped by Amazon, buying might be the answer. We tell our people continuously the two things that you have to figure out whenever you're test launching a product or building a, a new brand is you need to, number one, prove you can sell it because sales fixes everything. And then number two, you need to prove that Amazon won't stop you from selling it for whatever reason. Could be them, could be a counterfeit claim, could be some issue with the listing, could be some problem that just stops you from selling it. If you solve those two things, then you have a really huge upside potential in the business. And we try to simplify that down to problem, reaction, and solution, right? And what we're talking about here today are the pros and cons and problems of buying and selling these types of companies and what particular solutions you might want to engage yourself on. Aaron and I have been doing this together for a while. He's my point man for any buying and selling of these accounts from both directions. And because I've known him for a long time, I trust him in the process. And it is a process of going through and evaluating the company. So when they show up, what's the process look like for buying or selling? Yeah, it's a great question. Neil, um, and thank you for asking. In terms of the buying sites, when we're buying, so somebody comes to us, they throw in the towel or they just, they go on to a new venture. Then what happens is we put every store through a due diligence process, just as if we were acquiring a full-on active business with revenue and profits and team. Although our due diligence process is a lot shorter because there's only the store that we're really doing due diligence on. But typically what would happen is there'll be a call booked with my team. They'll go on a kind of an account checking call, which will basically be one of my team members just going through, making sure it's all in good standing, asking questions. We have a, a number of questions to, to deep dive into the history of the store and, and whatnot. And then on that call, there'll be an offer made or typically if we need to take it away and swing back around, that will happen with an offer. If the offer is taken up and we, the person wants to move forward, then from there, we will send asset purchase agreements, which is the, the legal and compliant way Amazon want these transactions done. And then we'll move the, the funds into, into escrow and, and handle it handle that way until the transfer is taken care of and the money gets moved Pretty from simple. escrow. To the yeah. person. It's pretty straightforward. It's basically buying a business at the end of the day for those who want to simplify. Because again, the business is the transactional asset that has to switch hands. It's not the seller central account. So if anybody's telling you, you can buy and sell seller central accounts, that's actually not true. You can't do that for any platform account. But you can transfer the asset login along with the sale of the business, uh, which is the actual asset that will transfer hands. So when you have a business you want to sell, to clarify what I'm saying, it has to have some asset base. It can't just be open three months ago. It probably has to, correct me if I'm wrong, have at least 12 months of historical selling experience of some kind. Maybe we want to go through that. That's one, I'm sure. Tell me what the rest of the bullet points are that people should consider if they're going to come for sale. What's the maximum they should get for their sale based on certain criteria? Yeah, so we've acquired stores on the very low end, anywhere from $500. These are the very entry-level ones. We paid up to $10,000 on the high end. Where that the stores fall in, on that range really depends on the metrics, the sales volume, the seller feedback, 
the, the payment cycle, all of these factors. So the process itself takes usually anywhere from 10 days to 20 days, I'd say, in terms of the, the timeline. But yeah, I hope that makes sense in terms of mm-hmm. how the stores are valued, how long it takes, and the, the process. Which So expect that the smaller accounts, potential smaller history and size will go a little faster on the sale. Expect those of you who might have six, 12 months or more of historical data and selling assets, reviews and other things within your business and ungatings and, and more, I'm going to features, is that the right way to say it? More unlocked features inside your seller central account from historical selling. You're going to expect the process to take just a little bit longer to ensure the value of that is is correctly attributed. Am I saying that the right way? Well, the reason there's a window between 10 to 20 days is because we do it on calls. So some mm-hmm. people are busy. Got, so uh, it's usually in that range of, between 10 to 20 days. Sometimes though, somebody can come to us and they, they have a store and we say, look, we'd love to buy this. Right now, we're going to kind of put this on hold for 30 days and we can swing back around. That doesn't happen so often, but that has happened over the last you know, few months. It's something we've been doing. If we don't have the need for a particular store, we say, hey, look, here's, here's our interest in the store, which is we'll, we'll, we'll give you a document to say, come back around or we'll reach back in about 30 days and we'll be you know, we'll take the store off your hands. So that's fantastic. Are you finding that that is growing the buying and selling of accounts? Has this been growing over the last couple of years if you're doing it? Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the more people understand that one, Amazon are okay with buying and selling businesses. And what we do is no different to acquiring an aggregator, buying a, an active business, same process, same everything, just a bit quicker because we're only acquiring the assets, the business and the asset is yeah. the store. So yes, yeah, absolutely. We, well, uh, the rest of you are going out of business, bankruptcy. You might find some additional accounts to buy. <laughs> I'm sure they're going to have to chop up a lot of the accounts they have in there. If those brands keep selling, I'm sure you heard they went into bankruptcy. The yeah. your space is changing dramatically. So I would expect in the coming year, there's going to be quite a few changes, opportunities for growth in your business, opportunities for you to expand what you're doing. In fact, what are you doing in the coming year? What's your game plan? Absolutely. So there's for us moving forward, we're going to be uh, creating our own community around Amazon selling. So we're going to be obviously talking about private label and wholesale. And Neil, well, actually, I've, I was thinking about this before. I'd love you to come in and or somebody from your team, at least, to you know, be part of our community. And as we've grown it, there's going to be a, a huge need for your knowledge. And I know you're a fountain of knowledge. We'd love you to join us over there. That'd be awesome, dude. Love to help you any way we can. And Voltage can support you. That's amazing. Thank you for offering. I'd love to be a part of that. And what is this community's focus going to be? What's the goal orientation of it? It's really going to be a place where Amazon sellers can come and learn from the best in the best in the various business models of the Amazon space, private label, wholesale, and every function of the business in both of them business models, logistics, sourcing products, everything from A to Z. We don't want to bring in-house experts in to be able to just teach people and share their knowledge of what they've acquired over the last 10 years and beyond. It's really a place to, for people to learn, grow, learn from the best in the industry, really, and get support with the challenges that are coming up. And the challenge are, challenges in Amazon space always always seem to be present, which makes the exciting space it is, I believe. Yeah, it is an opportunity. It is a challenge. There's always something new happening. There's every once in a while, we meet new problems we have to solve. And that keeps it interesting because business is nothing but a series of problem solving, which I think most people have heard me say before. And if you haven't, then you should understand if you get into business, it's a series of opportunities to challenge problems and to fix them and resolve them. So if you are in the place, folks, where you are thinking about selling a business you have that it has a seller central account and you're wondering what could it be worth to me, there's going to be some links in the show notes below uh, where you can check out those links and go uh, talk with Aaron and his team and get an assessment and see maybe if you got a 500 to a 5,000 to a $10,000 opportunity set in front of you in the next 10 to 20 days after you connect with him. If you're looking to buy one because you want to go big, you want to go strong, you are going to be a you know serious business person, and maybe you don't want to go through the long process of trying to get Amazon set up and brand registered and all the other stuff you got to do to get online. And maybe if you want the social media accounts and all the other assets that come with that brand already established uh, that you might be able to leverage, then you're going to have a link below there you want to connect as well. You know, what's the name of the business again? Ecomstores.com. Ecomstores.com. That's pretty simple. Yeah, ecomstores.com. If anyone, so there's a, there's a couple more points I just want to share this right around the, because I think it's important for folks. Most of your audience though are, I believe, from the private label space, right? Cool. So some of this, like a lot of the stores that we acquire have a number of bells and whistles to them, just to, just so everyone's clear on really what is the value of acquiring a store versus opening a new one. We talked a little bit about the payment cycles. These essentially increase your cash flow cycle up to 40%, allows the company to grow 
that 40% faster than if you had uh, a reserve on the store. But what we see a lot of high level sellers doing is actually having multiple stores that have no reserve payment cycles and they stagger them in their different companies. God forbid one Amazon store gets a ding on it or Amazon deactivate a listing or something happens. Amazon can hold your funds for 90 days until they investigate something in your store. We've seen that. We've all seen that. Yeah. A lot of sellers are essentially acquiring multiple of these stores to stagger their payments. So every two or three days, they're getting paid in full across their different companies, which allows the company to keep growing and keep scaling if one or even two of their stores gets into review with Amazon or something like that. I hope that makes sense in terms no, of- that does. In simple terms, you're telling me that cash flow is one of the biggest things about it. The opportunity to ha- how fast you can cash flow will be dependent upon the historical nature of the account and how many you know, features it's unlocked and how long it's done business and even how big it's done business for those features. And the third thing you're telling me is if I can get my cash flow moving faster, then I need less credit, less other mechanisms to, to get capital in order to continue the cycle of business purchasing inventory and operational turnover of inventory, which is a huge asset to any inventory based model of business, right? Exactly. And oftentimes these stores that we acquire have like literally thousands of ungated brands that are not ungated on new stores. Amazon are very, every year they're becoming more and more strict with what they kind of auto ungate. So a, a lot of folks in the wholesale space love that because they acquire a store and there's essentially thousands of more brands that are restricted for other sellers, which means typically they've got higher profit margins because less people are selling them and they can sell these restricted brands and products through acquiring the asset and the store. And really? finally, the, the, the last point, Neil, really is high inventory limits. And it's a big one for private label sellers. A lot of the stores that we get have a lot of sales history, which yeah. enable you to increase the inventory capacity quicker than if you're starting from scratch with a new store. And the, the reason that's important is because the more inventory you send into Amazon, the higher profit margin you can make per unit. And you don't have to deal with tons of tiny little shipments, which is kind of a headache. But it's annoying. It costs more. And frankly, the more inventory you send, the more your opportunity is for the algorithm to expand your reach in the marketplace above your competition. That's a pro tip for those of you who are paying attention. Aaron, thank you so much, dude. For ch- Is there anything we didn't cover that you want to cover real quick? I guess last question is, did I not ask you something that you would like me to make sure we cover before we wrap it up? I, I think we covered everything. I just wanted to get across the main, there's options out there. You can absolutely start a business with uh, a new Amazon store, absolutely, as we've talked about. There's options as folks want to hit the ground running and fast track their sales and profit and have an edge against the competition, which is what our business does all day long. And yeah, we've bought, sold, and transferred over 1,500 of these stores over the last three years, three, four years. We just make sure they're done right every time, and we've helped a, a bunch of sellers. So if anyone wants to reach out, they can go to ecommerce forward slash voltage, and that's it. Fantastic. Folks, go check that out if you're interested in... Uh... Buy or selling accounts, maybe you can get some cash. Maybe by the time this rolls out, you might have some money before the holidays. Who knows? Or some money in the coming year, if that's what you want to look at from selling. Or if you're going to buy, you might be able to run a lot faster in the coming year. Aaron, thanks so much for coming on, man. Sharing the pros and cons and being fully transparent, which is what's great about your personality. And I certainly appreciate you spending some time with me, man. Appreciate you, Neil. Thank you so much. Speak soon. Cheers. 